Um, yet another talk about round movie. Everybody's favorite, clearly, uh, the survey says. And so we're going to have Scott George for USGS, who is the Gobi hunter across the state. Um, and he's going to talk to us about the current status of round Gobi in eastern New York. So, Scott, take it away. Great, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everyone. Uh, you know, I, I've been studying around Gobi probably for the better part of a, a decade here, and uh, it seems like it, it takes takes more of a village each each year. And I've been really fortunate to work with an awesome cast of uh, both individuals and organizations on this research. And my goal for the talk today is really just to give you a kind of a, a snapshot or a state of where we are with the invasion um, in eastern New York. So certainly will not be all encompassing, but you know, the idea is to try to go through really the three sub-watersheds of interest here um, in you know, our half of New York. So I'm going to start by taking you through uh, the Mohawk River and associated sections of the Eastern Erie Canal. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the Upper Hudson and Champlain Canal. That's really the kind of the hot, high-stress area as gobies potentially are knocking on the door to you know, get to Lake Champlain. That's the, the most urgent research area right now. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Hudson River estuary and what's going on with gobies uh, in that unique habitat type. So, um, this is probably as much background as we're going to dive into here around goby are pretty well known uh, invasive at this point, but we know first identified in 1990, uh, the spread was rapid really in all directions. We get a brief, we'll say pause in the Utica area here around 2015 that really was never well understood by me at least. Um, and then gobies of course uh, by 2021 are starting to get widespread uh, at least through the Hudson River estuary. Um, this histogram here is the number of reports of round goby to the USGS uh, NAS database. And we can see as gobies become um, more widespread, the number of reports expectedly increases as well. This probably also reflects um, increased uh, research attention to the species as well. So I guess this is honestly more background information. This is the results of, I don't know, seven years of work that we've done on the Mohawk River and Eastern Erie Canal. So we've got trawl catch rate here on the top and eDNA here on the bottom. Um, these are arranged chronologically from 2016 through 2022. Uh, eDNA sampling has been uh, discontinued. That's why the data set here ends in 2022. And why did we discontinue? Because we have basically full saturation um, in the DNA signature um, at this point in time. But this ended up being really valuable research for a couple reasons. Um, we saw a number of instances where the trawl was unable to catch gobies for months or even years. Um, while the eDNA samples were still positive during that period. And, you know, this lends support to the value of eDNA as a sensitive screening method. Maybe gobies haven't reached that location yet, but we're picking up their DNA signature as uh, in a downstream direction. Uh, or gobies are at such low densities we can't catch them in the trawl. Um, whatever the case, um, the synergy between these two methods we felt was very high um, and a nice combination. So what else is going on in the Mohawk? Instead of actually showing you a time series of data, I'm just showing you a couple piles of fish and hoping you'll take my word for it here, but we do see that densities appear to be increasing on the Mohawk. Um, we are not under the impression that we have reached carrying capacity yet. Um, gobies are, you know, patchy, but, you know, still at low densities in many areas um, in the watershed. Uh, what type of community impacts are we seeing? I mean, this is an area that we still need to dive into more deeply, but um, the impact on benthic fish is probably one of the most obvious time series to investigate. And I'm just showing you one time series of tessellated darter catch rate um, in our trawl in the Utica area. These are average catch rates on the average of three poles and arranged chronologically. So you can see we drop almost two orders of magnitude. Um, interestingly, the 2023 data, we actually have an average of 10 darters per trawl, which might just be noise and what will later just continue to be a downtrend, but it is a little bit of a departure from what's occurred in Oneida Lake, and Tom Brookings been kind enough to share their trawl catch data with me each year, and uh, according to Tom, um, tessellated darters used to 
be really the dominant trawl catch in that lake, um, declined massively within a couple of years of Gobi arriving, and I believe 110 trawl polls were conducted on Oneida um, in 2023, not a single dart, the last one captured in 2017. So in that system, you know, we're starting to use words like extirpation uh, potentially, whereas in the associated parts of the canal system, we're not there yet. Um, maybe we'll get there, maybe we won't, but we're definitely moving more slowly than things did in Oneida. Um, this is new uh, that you haven't seen before. So. Uh, we conducted surveys in 20 tributaries to the Mohawk this year. These were quantitative three-task completion surveys, trying to actually get at the abundance, uh, you know, quantifying um, population estimates. And we did 20 tribs, basically all the major tribs, two sites on Squaberry Creek. Uh, in 2019, we only had gobies present in one. Uh, that was Nine Mile Creek, close to Rome, furthest west, no surprise. We repeated that effort in 2023. Uh, unfortunately, one of the sites in the Schoharie was just pie and chocolate milk the entire summer and we were never able to get into, but 19 of those 20 sites were resurveyed. Uh, if you had asked me what the over-under was on how many would be colonized by Gobi, I probably would have told you it maybe eight or 10. Um, and I should also point out that most of these are within the first five kilometers of their confluence with the Mohawk and there are no major barriers in between, so they should be accessible. Uh, again, I would have told you over under at eight or 10, um, we were wrong, um, it was four. And those four high density now in Nine Mile Creek, we caught a lot of fish here, and really just a single one or two gobies um, in both Oriskany and Fulmer Creek, and a couple gobies on the Outlaws, which was interesting because that was probably, I don't know, three, four miles upstream from its confluence there too, so that was probably the most interesting finding, but really not the, uh, widespread saturation that we might have expected. And this just goes back to upstream expansion is slower. I mean, all the evidence supports this. Uh, Gobies move downstream a lot quicker than they move upstream. All right, changing gears to the Champlain Canal and Upper Hudson system. Again, this is the, uh, say the high stress uh, area right now. Gobies, of course, first identified in the Hudson in 2021 from the confluence of the Mohawk and Hudson. It's about 60 miles to get into Lake Champlain. And the first two thirds of that journey, the first 40 miles or so are in an upstream direction, which as we just saw, probably works to our advantage. Um, through a partnership with the Lake Champlain Basin Program, we've been doing paired eDNA trawling and electrofishing at seven sites um, spanning most of the upper Hudson. And everything, if you saw my talk here last year, um, this is gonna look really similar because we did not document any expansion in 2023, which is fantastic. Um, all of the Gobi captures and all of the DNA detections are still confined to immediately below the lock C1 dam. So if you're not super familiar with the area, this is the mouth of the Mohawk River where it reaches the Hudson through multiple branches go upstream about three miles and you hit the Lock C1 dam. Um, we have Gobi captures right here, I mean, 20 feet downstream of the Tainer Gates. And we also have them, this is obscured here, but on both sides of the Lock Channel Peninsula. So we actually have them, we have a capture about, I don't know, 50 feet downstream of the Lock doors here at C1. Um, and we have a whole lot of eDNA data that suggests positives below and not even a single hit um, anywhere upstream of the C1 dam. So this just completely reinforces the data we had in 2022. Now, you always want to be very careful. You can prove presence, you can't prove absence, right? So we have a large suite of data that all points to the same conclusion, but you never know for sure. Um, so again, this represents five kilometers of expansion since Gobi's hit the Hudson, but zero expansion um, in 2023. It suggests that the dam and lock um, is still blocking the invasion, or at least that's what the data suggests. Um, and this is really interesting because if you know this area well, you know that this is not even a permanent dam. Um, the Tainer Gates are lifted oops, seasonally. Uh, this is true on some of the Mohawk River dams too. So these are pulled out of the water. There's what, six panels, I believe, that are lifted in the winter. And at that point, water channels through there with a really high velocity, and you're looking at really cold temperatures. So most fish species are probably not, I would assume, able to pass that. But nonetheless, um, it's a porous barrier. Um, Canal Corporation has decided to increase the period in which 
the Tainter gates are in the water to try to let water get very cold before they pull them, decreasing the chances of fish moving through. So the gates are now left in almost a month longer, so they're being pulled like around the second week of December and being put in earlier as well. So that is a mitigation measure that hopefully uh, works to our advantage. I should also mention um, we are doing VHS testing um, to try to understand if gobies on the invasion front are potentially bringing viral hemorrhagic septicemia with them towards Lake Champlain. Um, we're sending our fish to Rod Getchell at Cornell. He's running both pooled organ and brain samples. And we're doing two separate batches of fish each year. Um, Rod had 68 out of 69 negative in 2022, one inconclusive, um, which you know, is essentially a very weak amplification, but not sufficiently high that we can put you know, full confidence into it. So that's obviously unsettling. Um, one year later, 60 out of 60 are negative. So make of that what you will. You know, I've talked to Rod about this, and um, he feels that you know, there's really no, no major evidence to suggest that our population is carrying it yet. But generally, where gobies go, VHS seems to go too. So um, remains unresolved and un unsettling, I would say. Um, in the estuary, um, this work is largely being read, led by Rich Pendleton and uh, others uh, with, with DEC, um, but kind enough to uh, let me be part of it. Um, this is a seining time series of data. This is really aimed, this is the routine seining program looking at uh, herring and striped bass, but the bycatch of goby is still an interesting metric because they pull a lot of seines. Um, the gobies in the estuary are small, um, just like they are on the Mohawk. Um, you might have heard a talk earlier today, uh, you know, John Farrell was talking about having the largest gobies in New York. I mean, we might be competing for the smallest gobies in New York, and I'm not, we don't know exactly why that is. It's the same in Oneida Lake, too. Um, we have very small fish. Um, the downstream most captures, this has not changed in the past year, are still at the Roseton Generating Station. This was some impingement monitoring that found them. Um, there are now eDNA hits um, a little further downstream of Newburgh, so that does represent, um, you know, maybe some new information. The estuary is super interesting, right? Um, we've got gobies interacting with eels and crabs and sturgeon and all sorts of, you know, novel species that really haven't been documented, uh, those interactions in, in North America, um, outside of a little bit in St. Lawrence. So the estuary is a really exciting area of research right now. Um, Rich has an outstanding poster um, you should check out that'll tell you more about this. Um, Kelsey, I realized later, was actually scheduled before me, so hopefully you saw Kelsey's talk um, about uh, salinity tolerance and maybe giving some perspective about why gobies aren't um, going as deep into the estuary as, as we might have thought. Um, so the take home messages here. Um, much of this is unchanged from a year ago, which I guess is good. Um, we don't. We have patchy but fairly widespread goby distributions in the Mohawk. It's very easy to fail to catch gobies in the Mohawk still, but we also catch them at high abundances at a number of locations. Um, in the Champlain Canal, I mean, no documented advance, again, no documented advance in 2023. It would seem that the C1 dam is still holding back the invasion front. In the estuary, um, Again, we know they went down about 140 kilometers very quick, seem to have slowed. Gobies are a pretty low abundance. It's not real easy to catch gobies in the estuary at this point in time. Uh, there's been a lot of products published. Some of these are just published data sets that are publicly available. Others are interpretive journal articles and reports. Um, you're welcome to catch up with me later if you want to dive into any of that further. Um, and finally, what's coming up in 2024, um, this is kind of the collective we, um, you know, of all the organizations involved, uh, trying to summarize what's planned. Um, there's going to be continued trawling on the main stem of the Mohawk to maintain um, a time series of data, both in terms of goby abundance and in terms of the benthic fish that they might be impacting. Um, we're working on a new project um, with SUNY Cobleskill looking at really fine scale expansion on Schoharie Creek, trying to quantify that upstream expansion rate with painful accuracy, you know, down to like meters per year, because every time gobies show up in a new watershed or above a new barrier, the first thing anyone wants to know is how fast are they going to go, right? When are we going to expect them to get to, you know, such and such uh, location? And upstream expansion rates are very poorly understood for goby. We think they're slow, but then they go five kilometers on the Hudson in, you know, about a year or less, right, to reach the C1 dam. So we really want to try to pin this down. Schoharie is a great opportunity to do that, but it's big and it doesn't have barriers for a long distance. Um, and uh, Tom's got a poster um, talking about the very infancy of that, that effort that we started this, this fall. 
Um, on the upper Hudson Champlain Canal, trawling, electrofishing, eDNA will all be continued in their current capacity, as will the VHS testing. Lower Hudson, uh, the routine seining, of course, will continue. And um, this is something to talk to Rich about if you want to dive into it further. But uh, they have two very interesting uh, new studies kicking off, trying to figure out what the gobies are eating and maybe how many spawning adults are actually there. Um, with that, I want to acknowledge uh, Lake Champlain uh, Basin Program, uh, which funded a lot of this research, as well as the Mohawk uh, River Basin Program, which also supported a lot of it. And I need to acknowledge, uh, you know, most of the eDNA work you're seeing here was conducted by uh, you know, the Lamar uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Lab, Chris Reese and Meredith Bartron. Uh, they've done some awesome eDNA work for us uh, over the years. And uh, again, uh, DEC, both through Bureau of Invasive Species and uh, Mohawk River Basin Program, supported a lot of this work as well. So with that, I am happy to field any questions.